In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we were making the Gospels into the songs of the movie Encanto, the one that just came out, this, whose soundtrack has gotten very popular, I think that I would use the song for today's Gospel, We Don't Talk About Bruno, and I would change it to, We Gotta Talk About Peter. Because even before we have the threefold question from Jesus to Peter, do you love me? This gospel is really all about Peter. After all, Peter is the one who uh, instigates the fishing trip. Peter is the one who reacts the most strongly when, G when uh, the disciple whom Jesus loves declares that it, it is Jesus there standing on the shore. It is Peter whom, to whom Jesus says, go and help with the fish, with the nets. And it is to Peter that Jesus addresses his threefold question and prophecy of Peter's martyrdom. Indeed, this whole thing is about Peter, and it's both like and unlike all of the other stories about Peter in the other Gospels. You see, like the other Gospels, Peter appears in John's Gospel, but Peter is not unlike Mark's gospel, say, the main spokesperson for the disciples in John's gospel. Often in John's gospel, it's not one disciple who becomes the spokesperson, it's three. It's Peter and James and John, or it's Nathaniel and Philip, or it's some other small grouping of disciples who don't quite understand what Jesus is doing. And again, we have a grouping of disciples, both people who had fished before, like Peter and Andrew and the sons of Zebedee, and those who hadn't, like Thomas, who was a Jerusalemite, it seems, and Nathaniel, who lived in Cana of Galilee, far from the sea. So it's, maybe it's not surprising they didn't catch anything, because, you know, when you take someone fishing the first time and they don't know that you have to be quiet that sound travels through water and you scare the fish when you talk or splash or move about on the boat too quickly. It's not surprising they didn't catch anything when they went fishing that night. But Peter is, in this, the focus. Even though there's these other disciples there, they're met, the rest are mentioned once, but Peter is mentioned several times. Because it's through Peter that we see this encounter with Jesus. John's gospel shows us what redemption looks like through the eyes and life of Peter in today's gospel. Because, if you remember, back a few weeks ago, Peter made a threefold faux pas. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know the man. And the mirror of that in today's gospel. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon, son of John, do you love me? Is maybe pretty easy to see. But what's more difficult to see is the greater redemption arc that Peter goes through just in the, in the space of today's gospel reading. Because you see, Peter has gone back to the beginning at the start of today's gospel story. It is Peter who says, let's go fishing. Remember, when Jesus came to Peter and called him to follow him on the way to proclaim the gospel, Peter was fishing. And now Peter, not knowing what to do in the face of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, has reverted back to his natural habitat, the Sea of Galilee in a fishing boat. And Jesus comes to Peter to draw him again out of the boat to a fishing of a very different kind. 
He is tempted to go back to his old life, to pretend that things were the way they were before. He's tempted to pretend like everything that happened had no bearing, and he can just go back to his old life as if nothing had happened, as if he isn't fundamentally changed in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, whom he has followed for three years. In the midst of this possibility, this fork in the road for Peter, Jesus stands on the shore by a charcoal fire with breakfast warming on the rocks and asks Peter to come to breakfast. And Peter dives into the water. The the fact that Peter even though it's only a hundred yards, is so impatient to get to Jesus that he jumps into the water and swims is interesting. But there is, again, something else going on within this ark. There is almost a sense that Peter is being baptized in his eagerness. Peter dives into the water of baptism and comes out renewed and ready to meet Jesus cleansed from sin and born again, as we say, about the waters of baptism. And of course, the first thing that Jesus does after Peter gets to shore is puts Peter back to work. That's nice, Peter. I'm glad you're so eager, but please go help your friends get the fish on shore. And only then, after they have all gotten to table, after everyone is able to be at table because the work is done, does Jesus, well, first Jesus feeds them. You would think that Jesus might think about going through this ritual with Peter before they eat, but no, eating is more important. Being together, eating together, sharing this meal, which has a lot of Eucharistic undertones, took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his friends, might sound familiar. Only after they have been fed by bread and fish does Jesus then begin to ask Peter the questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the final words that Jesus says to Peter, to the rest of the disciples, and to us is follow me. And that two-word command, that two-word instruction, tells us a lot more than we think. One of the most fascinating things about, about babies is somewhere around four, three or four months, uh, something in their brain called mirror neurons begins to really, really wake up. And these are neurons in the brain that we will have for our entire lives that mirror what they see. And so this is, this is the part of the brain that when, at about three or four months, when you begin to smile at a small baby, they begin to smile back. Now, they might be happy, generally happy to see you, but they are beginning to reflect the facial muscles that says, I'm happy to see you. They're beginning to, to connect the joy that they hear in your voice and see on your face with the joy of reciprocity, reflecting that joy back out toward you. And those are really important things, these mirror neurons, because they teach us, they are the first way that we learn in our lives. And they don't go away. For all of our lives, these mirror neurons enable us to see something and to imitate it, to see something and repeat it. It's almost as if God has given us the ability to see something and to follow in that way. Almost as if God gave us this ability knowing that it would come in handy, knowing that God, who loves us and desires for us to be close with God, to imitate God, gave us that ability as part of our makeup. 
knowing that it would come in incredibly handy for us. And so when Jesus says, follow me, it's not that Jesus literally wants the disciples to walk behind him as he walks along the beach. It means that the, that the disciples should mirror what they have seen him do today, on that day, on that morning. That this whole event from the fishing boat onward is something that they should see and imitate. That this ark of redemption that Peter goes through, forgiveness that Jesus offers, renewing of relationship that exists now between Peter and Jesus is something the disciples should not just say, oh, oh, that was nice. They should go and do likewise. They should go out and imitate that with everyone they know, everyone they see at every possible opportunity. That this tableau is the way the church should work. And in fact, is the way that God has always worked. Because God's salvation, God's forgiveness, the renewal of the world comes to us not as a response for us understanding it. Peter does not understand what is happening as Jesus is going through this triune forgiveness with Peter. Frankly, I think Peter reacts to it better than I would have. Because that third time, I might have been like, what do you think, Jesus? But Peter doesn't understand. But the text makes it very clear that Peter does not understand what is going on. But it doesn't matter because Jesus is doing it anyway. We don't have to understand what God is doing for God to do it. We don't understand how baptism works. We never have. We might never. We probably never will until the coming of the kingdom, until Jesus comes back. But we know it works. We know it's incredibly important. We don't understand the Eucharist. It's a sacrament. It's a holy mystery. We'll never fully grasp everything that it is. But we know that it's holy. We don't have to understand what God is doing. That's not the point. When a baby sees us smile and responds, it's not responding because it somehow understands what that smile signifies. It will come to understand that as it grows. They will understand that as they grow and begin to learn more about themselves and the world around them. But they are simply responding to their experience. They are mirroring, imitating, learning the same way that God calls us to in God's forgiveness, in God's redemption, and in God's love. God does not expect us to understand. God expects us to imitate, calls us to respond in imitation. When God forgives, God offers us the opportunity to respond by imitating, by forgiving others. In God's redemption of the world in Jesus Christ, God invites us to respond by living into that redemption, by imitating Jesus and giving our lives for others. In loving us, God invites us to respond by imitating that love in everyone and everything that we encounter. Not because we understand it, but because we were first shown it by God and a part of our life is to learn by imitating. That is how we live out our lives. That is how we are called in the Gospels and in our baptism and in the Eucharist to live out in the world. Not through understanding, not through erudite explanation. If you can do that, great. But that's not required. What's required is that when Jesus says, follow me, learn from me, imitate me, that we do.
Amen.